Hello my dear friends and welcome back to another Star Wars news update. In today's video we're going to be talking about Rogue Squadron and more. As always my dear friends, before we dive into the news, please be sure to hit that big red subscribe button down below if you've not done so already, and also be sure to give that bell a good old tickle or a smash, whichever you prefer, to be alerted every single time that I post a new video. But as we say around these parts, without much further ado and without any more jibber jabber, let's dive straight into it. So my dear Megalorians, we're going to start with Rogue Squadron and some new details that have emerged. So last week we learned that apparently the film was delayed because production was a mess and this was in terms of the script and rewrites. But now we've learned the problem was way deeper than that. The Hollywood Reporter have come out and said that essentially the main problem was creative difference. That's right my friends, once again a project is canned because of creative differences with Lucasfilm. And I use the word canned because even though they say it's been delayed indefinitely, Let's be real, we're probably never going to see this movie being made. We've seen a similar situation in the past, and we know what Lucasfilm mean when they say delayed indefinitely. It's the coy way that they word things for the press, but there's a different truth beneath it. Let's see what this article by Comic Book has to say, and then we'll discuss it. Star Wars Rogue Squadron reportedly delayed due to Patty Jenkins' creative differences with Lucasfilm. It wasn't too long ago Star Wars Rogue Squadron was expected to be the next Star Wars film to hit theatres. At one point, it was going to enter pre-production by the end of this year and pick up principal photography early in 2022. Now the film's been delayed indefinitely and will likely no longer meet its current release date of December the 22nd, 2023. Though Lucasfilm has yet to officially comment on the matter, one Hollywood insider suggests that creative differences between the studio and filmmaker is what led to the delay and it's unclear if the two sides will be able to work together at a later date. So the latest report comes from the former Hollywood reporter editor Matthew Bellany, who says that Patty Jenkins was frustrated with the micromanagement of select Lucasfilm executives, eventually opting to pursue other opportunities while Lucasfilm worked on fixing its internal problems. And here we go again, how many times have we heard about certain executives at Lucasfilm trying to control the creatives? It's such a common trope at this point, I'm not even surprised. Matthew Bellany, who wrote this piece, did not name names, but I'm sure we know who he's talking about. The higher-ups always want to get too involved and oversee every little detail, and it gets to a point where the movie that the director started creating doesn't even look the same by the end. But in this case, problems began right from the start. And what a shame, until Lucasfilm can sort this internal power struggle out, the problem is going to keep happening with every director and every creative. You have to give the director a certain creative freedom to create the film that they envisioned. Overseeing a project is one thing, but it says a lot when multiple directors have walked away before any production even began. But let's get back to the article, we'll talk about this in more depth at the end. In Matthew Bellany's own words, he says, that's not unusual of course, but it's a laughably recurring problem at Lucasfilm under President Kathleen Kennedy. Top filmmakers are dying to make a Star Wars movie until they sign on and experience the micromanagement and plot points by committee process. He added, it happened to the Game of Thrones guys David Benioff and Dan Weiss, I don't know if I pronounced that right, who were hired to create a new trilogy but bailed. It also happened to Ryan Johnson, whose own planned trilogy was shelved. Jenkins wasn't willing to dick around and she has other projects, notably Wonder Woman 3 at Warner Brothers, where she enjoys more creative freedom. When Rogue Squadron was announced, Disney went out of its way to film a teaser featuring Jenkins, who would have been the first woman to direct a Star Wars film. At the time, it was even being heralded as the greatest fighter pilot movie ever made. Jenkins' last public comments on the project suggested the film's script was nearing completion. I'd been on it already for six months before I even announced that, so we're pretty deep into it. We're finishing a script, crewing up, and it's all going wonderful. I'm so excited about the story and excited that we're the next chapter of Star Wars, which is such a responsibility and such an opportunity to really start some new things. So that's the article guys, and surprise surprise, more problems at Lucasfilm. I don't really talk about that much here on my channel, it's not what I do, but when the frequency of a problem at Lucasfilm becomes the default, there is definitely an issue. I doubt Lucasfilm are ever going to come out and say what really happened, but we probably will find out soon enough what's going on with Rogue Squadron. And when it comes to Lucasfilm's organisation of recent cinematic releases and upcoming ones, it's really been something of a shambles. I don't think many of us were too surprised when Rogue Squadron was delayed, but the reason that it was, which we just spoke about, is all too familiar 
familiar. Creative differences are something that we saw with the original Episode 9 Jewel of the Fates by Colin Trevorrow before he was let go and J.J. Abrams was called upon to make The Rise of Skywalker. And of course, naturally, as a result, the consensus within the fandom leans heavily towards fans not trusting Lucasfilm whenever they announce upcoming movies. It's now the norm that we don't believe them until we actually see them. The same was true for Ryan Johnson's trilogy, and the same is happening with the Patty Jenkins film. And to be completely honest with you, I don't think we're getting a 2023 Star Wars movie at all. We've heard rumours about a High Republic one, or maybe even an Old Republic movie, but in reality, 2023 is a very optimistic release window, given that the one that was meant to fill that slot has just been canned. Lucasfilm would do well to just focus on the Disney Plus projects which we're all excited about, and only produce cinematic releases for well-planned stories where it's all mapped out in advance. You have directors whose visions you agree with, you allow them to do their job, and there aren't any last-minute pullouts. Lucasfilm over-promise and under-deliver, and I'd rather they announce one big cinematic release for a future date, which they can actually stick to with a properly planned production schedule. Instead of promising four or sometimes even five future movies, and we only ever get one of them, if any at all. And I always try to stay positive on my channel. I'm looking forward to all of the upcoming shows and even movies, but it's just a damn shame this keeps happening. And as I say, until Lucasfilm sort out their internal problems, this is an issue that's not going to go away. But my dear friends, let's finish off with some positivity. We're going to be talking about the Under the Helmet Legacy special, which came out on Disney Plus Day. As a Boba Fett fan, I absolutely loved it. As I mentioned in my full review, it's a pity they didn't include Mark Anthony Austin, but we did get some Daniel Logan. But one detail they mentioned is about Captain Rex, because the design for his helmet is secretly a Boba Fett Easter egg. It was inspired by an earlier version of Boba Fett in the design. So let's Let's talk about it. While Boba Fett's first on-screen appearance came during the Star Wars Holiday Special in a cartoon sequence, it wasn't the first time the legendary bounty hunter was introduced to the public. Boba Fett's costume was featured in a local California parade wearing an early model of his helmet that should look quite familiar to present-day fans. As revealed in the Under the Helmet Legacy of Boba Fett special, originally, Boba Fett's Mandalorian armor was meant to belong to an entire faction of Imperial Super Troopers. Budget constraints forced George Lucas to give the now iconic armor to a single new character. It's clear from the footage that this version of Fett's armor was not quite the final version used in The Empire Strikes Back. Notice the Jake ID calls adorning the helmet. While they were eventually removed prior to The Empire Strikes Back, the same ID calls would be used years later in 2008's The Clone Wars, and they would be used on everyone's favorite clone captain, Captain Rex. While the Jake ID designs would later be given a canonical significance as the traditional Mandalorian sigil, it's impressive that the design which began on Boba Fett's helmet for the duration of a single parade was then used years later to become a dynamic easter egg, an iconic part of a whole new character. As I say guys, go check out the Under the Helmet special if you've got Disney+, Plus, and go check out my review which I included in the Obi-Wan Kenobi teaser breakdown. But otherwise, my dear friends, that brings us to the end of this news update. If you enjoyed it, please be sure to give me a big fat thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you're brand new and a massive welcome if you are, and if you're feeling generous and you want more more videos that are not found here on YouTube, then why not consider becoming a patron? The link is down there in the description, but otherwise, I'm wishing you all an amazing Monday. I'm Star Wars Meg, may the force be with you, and I'll see you tomorrow.